It's an exciting day for the Canadian Space Agency. And in fact, uh, it, it really is going to be an historical day. And I think it's fitting that uh, we are launching such a mission uh, in the year of our 50th anniversary of spaceflight in Canada. Um, you know, the launch of Alouette 1 back in 1962 gave us a confidence and the credibility to pursue what is now our flight heritage with respect to robotics, satellite communications, optics, and Earth observation radar. And I think that this mission, such a mission that we have today with Chris Hadfield, the agency is positioned well from our heritage and from our history, but this mission will carry us through the crossroads uh, that we have and will allow Canada and the Canadian Space Program to command its space dense destiny. Now, ça m'a fait, fait un grand honneur d'avoir une invité spéciale aujourd'hui et j'invite le gouverneur général du Canada, le très honorable David Johnson, à dire quelques mots. What a thrill it is to be here at the Canadian Space Agency for this historic launch. J'attends ce moment depuis ma visite à l'agence il y a un an. Puisque les missions spatiales sont le fruit d'années de préparation, j'aimerais d'abord féliciter chaque personne qui a contribué à cet effort. En tant que gouverneur général, je suis très fier de savoir que dans quelques mois à peine, Chris Hatfield deviendra le premier Canadien de l'histoire à commander la Station Spatiale Internationale. Comme vous le savez, il mènerait des expériences scientifiques, il pilotera le Canada M2 et il effectuera des opérations robotiques pendant sa mission en orbite. Tout comme fait, je crois que nous pouvons affirmer que Chris Hadfield et l'Agence spatiale canadienne sont des éléments vitaux de cette mission internationale. I also want to say how pleased I am that Chris will be bringing with him Eddie the Vice Regal Lion. <laughs> For those of you who aren't familiar with Eddie, he's the mascot, the Rita Hall mascot for our EduZone online educational resource. EduZone was launched earlier this year as a tool for students and teachers to learn more about the role, responsibilities, and history of the Office of Governor General, as well as the two official residences. And we're very excited to be part of this mission and to know that Chris will have Eddie up there accompanying him all the time. One of the priorities of my mandate is to encourage learning and innovation in Canada. And I know Chris shares this passion, having spent much of his career speaking to students on the importance of pursuing their education. Of course, Chris Hatfield is just one of a number of Canadian astronauts who have advanced our efforts in space and our learning here in Canada. I'm so delighted to be here with Steve McLean, with David Saint-Jacques, and Robert Thirst today. And on August 29th, I was in my hometown of Sault Ste. Marie for its 100th anniversary. And there was our neighbor when I was a boy growing up in Sault Ste. Marie, Roberta Bonder from Sault Ste. Marie. And I salute their contributions to our shared quest for knowledge. Your presence reminds us that space science and exploration is by nature a collaborative effort in which one discovery builds upon the next. A space mission is also a wonderful example of international cooperation, as evidenced by today's launch from Kazakhstan aboard a Soyuz spacecraft. Chacun de vous pratique ce que j'appelle la diplomatie de savoir, c'est-à-dire notre capacité à partager nos connaissances au-delà des disciplines et des frontières, voire au-delà des limites de la Terre, afin d'apprendre. Au nom de tous les Canadiens, je vous souhaite une mission sécuritaire et réussie. Merci.
Thank you, uh, Governor General. Um, I just want to point out that our, our byline with respect to the 50th anniversary is uh, innovation, vision, and passion. And that maps into the vision you have with respect to innovation and our procurement, I feel, has been driving innovation for 30 years. So it's, uh, this is all coming together today. Now what I'd like to do is introduce a video uh, from Chris Hatfield. Bonjour tout le monde, c'est uh, Chris Hatfield ici, uh, Centre Spatial Baitendour, Kazakhstan. C'est la quarantine ici, uh, c'est la rivière Sir Daria, en arrière de moi. I wanted to welcome everybody uh, to the launch. It's, you know, it's historic. We are leaving Earth permanently for the first time in our species. And this isn't here, this isn't a seaport, this isn't an airport. This place is a spaceport. This is where we leave Earth and where we come back and land out on the step in this place. It, for us, it's, a, it's an amazing place to be. And for me personally, an amazing time to be. Ça me donne beaucoup de plaisir d'être ici uh, à cet événement avec vous, avec la famille, avec uh, nos amis. Uh, c'est un moment incroyable, un moment historique pour nous autres. Et c'est un moment absolument uh, superbe de voir ensemble. So, uh, on behalf of the crew, on behalf of Roman and Tom and myself and everybody else that has supported us, I thank you for the support that you've given. Uh, I welcome you very much to the event, and I hope you really enjoy the show. I know that from inside the Soyuz, on our way up to the space station, we are going to be enjoying ourselves. Best of luck to everybody, and I'll, uh, if I don't talk to you from space, I'll talk to you when I get back. Okay, the launch is at 7.12. It is uh, 6.59 uh, right now. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite Robert Thursk and David Saint-Jacques up here to give you a first-hand account of uh, their experiences relative to this launch. Bob launched uh, May 27th, I think, 2009, for 188 days on the station. And so Chris is following with the second mission. And David Saint-Jacques, we hired as a new astronaut along with Jeremy Hansen in March of 2009. And both he and Jerry are excelling in the NASA training class. So both of you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear us? Yeah. Yes. Um, OK. You know, uh, this is great to be, be here today. and. You know, Expedition uh, 34, 35 for me always seemed to be months off, years off, but today's the day, and uh, there's absolutely an air of excitement. I guess we got 13 minutes uh, to go, so I'm really thrilled uh, that it's so close now. You know, there's hundreds of scientists, engineers, flight controllers, robotic instructors, family support people, managers, administrators have been getting ready for this flight, but Chris has also been getting ready as well. Training has preoccupied his mind for two and a half, five years, because he's my backup as well. Yes, that's true. Yeah. What is training like for him? So you know, I've had the chance to go through basic training at NASA and also in Russia with Jeremy. And uh, training is mainly all about getting ready for this day, really. And people often ask, are the astronauts nervous on the launch pad? Est-ce que les gens sont nerveux dans la, dans la station ou sur la fusée? Et en fait, comme tout le monde le sait, la meilleure remède contre le stress, c'est d'être préparé. Et Chris est préparé. Et c'est ça l'entraînement. Il sait tout sur le bout des doigts. Vous voyez sur les télévisions en ce moment, le, le, la, la fusée Soyuz elle-même, on a le, le sommet de la, de la fusée où on voit le, la capsule. En ce moment, les trois sont en dedans, là, dans leur scaphandre, vraiment euh, complètement euh, strappés, si on veut. Ils ont fait tous les tests possibles. Chris, ici, le commandant du Soyuz, Roman, et Tom, un collègue de la NASA. Vous montrez à l'intérieur de la capsule de quoi ça a l'air. Ça, c'est la capsule qu'on voit ici, euh, au sommet de la fusée. Et euh, vous voyez un ingénieur ici, ça donne à peu près la taille, hein? c'est pas très gros. Des années de préparation pour tout connaître sur le bout des doigts. Chris est assis dans son siège comme ça, c'est pas très confortable, ils vont être comme ça pour deux jours en route vers la station. Chris est le copilote du Soyuz. C'est un entraînement qui a pris plus d'un an pour euh, être prêt à, à accomplir là, ce, cet important rôle. Hein? Et s'il y avait un problème avec son collègue russe, Chris devrait prendre la relève. Vous pouvez voir sur les écrans de la NASA la fusée. On est au Kazakhstan, donc dans la steppe. On va être un lancement au coucher du soleil. La température est idéale. On devrait avoir une très belle vue. Je vais parler un peu de l'entraînement brièvement. 
Chris a fait euh, des années d'entraînement. Ça fait pendant dix ans, en fait, qu'il commence à être impliqué dans cette mission-là. Sur la centrifuge, puis des entraînements aux opérations d'urgence à bord de la station ou à bord euh, du véhicule. Donc, euh, tout, dans le but de tout avoir sur le bout des doigts pour être euh, prêt à prendre le relais comme commandant en cas d'urgence. Puis Bob, peut-être, maybe you can tell us about uh, some scientific experiments up there. Well, the International Space Station is now fulfilling the role for which uh, five space agencies initially uh, designed it uh, to fulfill, and that is to be a world-class facility for performing uh, research and development in a weightless uh, environment. So I'm talking about animal biology, I'm talking about plant biology, I'm talking about human physiology, I'm talking about fluid physics, I'm talking about materials processing, I'm talking about technology demonstrations of, of new medical hardware or engineering hardware. It's got phenomenal uh, laboratory facilities now aboard the station. Chris's responsibilities will be, uh, amongst other things, to take care of two of the more important research laboratories, the European and the Japanese uh, laboratory that's aboard the station. They're on the, the front end of the, the station right there. And I'm proud to say that we have a good collection of Canadian experiments. Of the over 100 experiments aboard the International Space Station for the next uh, five to six months, uh, five will, will be Canadian. So we actually have the, the chance of having one of the, uh, the main uh, scientists involved uh, in those experiments. Present. Dr. Richard Hewson from University of Waterloo. <laughs> Another thing that Chris uh, might do, of course, we know Chris is a very accomplished spacewalker, hein, the first Canadian to do a spacewalk, the premier Canadian to march in space. On espère qu'il aura la chance d'en faire durant cette mission-ci. C'est pas encore confirmé, mais il est prêt. Ça, c'est sûr qu'il est prêt. Et puis aussi, évidemment, la robotique spatiale, qui est toujours au premier plan dans les de la station spatiale. On parle maintenant de tous ces véhicules qui amènent du cargo, du ravitaillement à la station. Ils doivent être attrapés en orbite avec le bras spatial. Chris est prêt à faire ça. Euh, Bob a eu la chance euh, de participer à ces opérations d'arrimage spatial déjà, un, un pionnier là-dedans, et euh, Chris va avoir probablement la chance de faire ça aussi durant sa mission. Peut-être euh, quelques mots au sujet du rôle de commandant que Chris va devoir euh, soutenir. You know, one of the really neat things about uh, having been a Canadian astronaut for 25 years is watching the evolution of the role and responsibilities of Canadian astronauts. We started off with uh, limited uh, roles and responsibilities as payload specialists aboard the, the space uh, shuttle, and then evolved to uh, mission specialist status, performing EVAs, performing robotic operations, as you men mentioned, <coughs> flying on the space shuttle, flying on uh, the Soyuz vehicle, doing short duration flights, doing long duration flights. And now Canada has the opportunity, the smallest space agency partner in the space station program to take on the major crew role. Chris Hadfield, a couple months from now, will become the crew commander of the International Space Station crew. This is a really good demonstration of how well this partnership works, that the smallest partner can take on a major critical role. Chris's responsibilities will, of course, be uh, to uh, make sure that uh, the station stays safe, that the crew stays safe, that all the mission objectives are fulfilled and also to try to maintain the psychosocial uh, morale uh, of the crew. And mealtime is one way that Chris is going to do that. He's bringing along a number of Canadian food items, uh, smoked salmon, beef jerky, caribou jerky, uh, that he'll be sharing with his uh, uh, European, Russian, and American counterparts. I guess there's a lot of food sharing going on. It, I was really surprised, Debbie, the role that food can play. If you ever have a disagreement with anyone, get together over food. That'll correct it. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we should move our attention to uh, what's going on in Kazakhstan right now. They're on there. So we are now five, six minutes uh, from launch. What, what do you think is going on uh, up there? They're in the Soyuz. What, what went through your mind when you were there? Well, we uh, went, entered inside the capsule three hours before uh, launch. Uh, when the hatch was closed, it was just the three of us, you just relax. Suddenly, you don't have the expectations of this large group of people on you anymore and all the ceremonial and traditional cultural things to, to fulfill. Now it's just you, your two crewmates, and your spacecraft. And you feel very uh, uplifted there. There's a lot of things to do in that three-hour period of time. So check all the systems on the spacecraft. Make sure that they're ready for, for launch today. Uh, do a pressure check on the capsule, that uh, volume that you see right here. It must be airtight. 
do a pressure check on the spacesuits that they're wearing. They must be uh, airtight. Just here is Chris uh, up there yeah. with his checklist reviewing stuff with his commander. The last uh, 20 minutes or so before uh, launch there is a time for reflection, to think about uh, the mission that you're just about to uh, launch on, what it means in, in um, world history. Think about your family, friends, think about all of you. Uh, Chris would have seen your uh, video greeting on his bus ride out to the launch pad uh, this morning and would have felt very tight, very uh, united with you. There's two cameras aboard the, 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 the shuttle capsule, so on the first third of the way up, you'll see Chris and Roman. Uh, about a, the middle third, you'll see a, a view of Tom Marshburn, the, the flight engineer too. And then the last uh, third on, on the way up, uh, we'll see uh, Chris and uh, Roman again. Uh, the engines will ignite about 20 seconds before liftoff, and about 10 seconds before liftoff, they'll reach full thrust. And then at the moment of liftoff, you'll see the rocket lift up and the gantries uh, fall away. Chris has flown twice on the space shuttle. Uh, this ride is going to be completely different for him. Uh, the shuttle is very noisy, very loud, a lot of vibration, a lot of uh, shaking. This ride here is going to be quite a bit smoother. He's not even going to know that they've lifted off, except that he'll see the countdown, climber, uh, countdown timer uh, start to move, uh, move positively. Um, the only exception uh, would be that uh, this is, Soyuz is a three-stage rocket. So when one stage is extinguished, it will fall off, and the crew will go from four Gs down to zero Gs for a couple of seconds until the next engines kick in. And then they'll go back to four Gs. So they'll be sitting in their, in their seats under the first stage, and then the, that stage ends, they got thrown forward, and then two seconds later, the next stage will kick in, they get thrown back again. <laughs> Other than that, it's a, it's a Rolls Royce or Cadillac ride up to, uh, to orbit. Um, again, they'll be monitoring their systems on the, the way up. Um, they'll probably have a, a couple of controls to send. I mentioned the camera uh, and the communication uh, equipment checks that will need to be done on the, on the way up. Roman here is holding his flight procedures. Uh, Roman and, uh, and Chris, as uh, David already mentioned, play the major role, and uh, Tom in the right seat will s provide a, a support role. A minute and a half up, uh, you'll notice a puff of smoke from the top of the, um, the Soyuz rocket. Don't get worried. That's just the, um, the escape system. The very top part of the capsule will not be needed after the first, uh, after a minute and a half has elapsed. So you see a puff of smoke. There's nothing wrong going. It's just going to fall off. And, uh, and then shortly after that, um, you'll notice that the, the first stage will separate. So those Roman candle looking uh, booster rockets on the bottom engine, bottom part of the rocket will also be jettisoned. Don't worry uh, about that. Uh, the third stage will ignite about four minutes uh, after launch. Probably won't uh, see that and that's when the crew will, will get jolted around uh, again. They'll be talking to uh, launch control all the way up. Uh, I think that the um, uh, the president of the Russian Space Agency may be talking to them on the way up as well. There's a number of dignitaries that are in a bu bunker, just maybe uh, three or 400 meters away from the, the launch pad there. If there is a problem during, um, uh, prior to launch, then they'll be able to quickly access the crew and, and, get, them, um, and get them out of there. But it'll, it's going to go absolutely uh, flawless here. So there, there we are, two, three minutes from launch. This is for them the end of a very long day. They've been strapped in there for over two hours, but they woke up uh, more than 10 hours ago getting ready, getting checked, seeing their doctor, checking their equipment. So this is the culmination not only of a big day, but of course uh, several years now of training. Away from launch. You know, it's uh, one of the really enjoyable aspects of launching on a Soyuz is experiencing the other cultures. So Chris has rode, ridden twice on, uh, on a shuttle. And there's a certain way that uh, NASA manages a shuttle launch. And this is a Soyuz launch experience. And there's a certain way that uh, uh, the Russians manage these uh, uh, launch events, the way they do quarantine. A lot of the Russian traditions, you might have seen a, a couple of the traditions this morning on TV. The crew members now, write their name on the bedroom door. The uh, they're blessed by the, the Russian Orthodox in. priest. And, and uh, prayers for a safe a launch are, are made with the crew and the family. And then you've heard about some of the other traditions as well. It really makes the, the whole day very special and unique. There's an air of excitement amongst the family, amongst obviously the, the, the crew. Uh, today is a different day, and, and everything that Chris has been training for and what you've we been preparing for is all coming to a culmination in uh, 
one minute here. Il nous reste peut-être une minute là, avant le décollage. Tout le monde est prêt, tout a été vérifié. On sent la fébrilité dans l'air, je ne sais pas pour vous, mais <rire> moi oui. Imaginez Chris. Chris et Tom vont avoir des windows. Ils vont être trop busy pour regarder la window. Mais about uh, two minutes in, after launch, the, the cowling or the fairing covering the capsule will, will fall away and they'll uh, have window views. Ground umbilicals being detached. La fusée est maintenant totalement autonome. On a ses batteries. Second tower now separating. 15 seconds and counting. Preliminary. Preliminary command confirmed. Engines firing. Main lift off. Five, four, three, two, one, and lift off. Tom Marshford, Ramon Romanenko, and Chris Hatfield making their way towards the International Space Station. still continuing to fire nominally. Flight stable, parameters of the booster are stable. Okay, copy, we are feeling great, we're feeling, uh, and there is vibration. Now one minute 54 seconds in, the launch escape tower has been jettisoned from the spacecraft. Ah, uh, jettisoned, confirmed. Now, you can see the four strap-on boosters separating one minute 58 seconds into flight. Being jettisoned, they've completed their job and dropped away at an altitude of about 28 statute miles. So he's now traveling at about 3,350 miles an hour. So, nominal on board. Two minutes, 38 seconds now into flight, the launch shroud being jettisoned. Great. Rocketed at an altitude now about 48 miles high. Déjà 40 000 d'altitude, 60 km. Crew inside. Vehicle stabilization still performing as planned. Everything going flawlessly on this launch. Giving the wave, still doing well. Observing and everything is well. 200 seconds of flight. The second stage or core stage continuing to fire as planned. In the top left corner of the video, you see a, a toy, a clown toy that's hanging there. That's a toy from Roman's daughter and that's functioning as their G meter. So if it's hanging straight down, they're under G. When it starts to float, they've made it to space. Une autre chose qu'il faut remarquer, quand le commandant veut appuyer sur des boutons sur le panneau, il n'est pas capable de se rendre. Ils sont tellement attachés serrés, il faut qu'il utilise un bâton, là, comme une extension. 
Puis on voit la terre derrière, c'est l'horizon qu'on voit par le hublot. Again, the second stage continuing to fire. The core stage, 56 feet in length, 13 and a half feet in diameter with a single engine and four fuel chambers providing 96 tons of thrust for the 3 minutes and 28 seconds. Les pas en ce juste vérifier que tout fonctionne normalement. Ils savent par cœur que tout est correct sur leurs instruments. So you will then use its hot staging technique, firing the third stage while the second is still burning. Everyone's too busy to uh, look out the window right now, but you can see um, that they're way up there. Um, maybe approaching 100 kilometers up, and the sky is now black. Parameters are nominal. Okay, copy. We're feeling well, and everything is nominal on board. So the third stage now ignited, the second stage shutting down and separated. Ramon's going to change the uh, camera. Separating controls. at an altitude of 105 miles. On voit Chris en haut, euh, en haut à droite. So again, second yeah. stage separation is confirmed. The Soyuz now being propelled by its single engine of the Soyuz third stage. That single engine providing 30 tons of thrust avec Roman, avec for an additional four minutes and two seconds. Tout se comporte correctement dans la séquence de la mise en orbite. Il y a quelques instants, ils ont euh, laissé tomber un réservoir d'essence, un réservoir de carburant qui était vide. C'est la dernière phase maintenant nominal. de l'insertion en orbite. Everything is nominal on board. So just over five minutes and 30 seconds into powered flight, the Soyuz craft now being propelled by its third stage. No issues being reported, everything performing as planned. 350 seconds. Off flight, everything is nominal. Just now coming up on the six minute mark of powered flight. As soon as they uh, reach orbit, uh, they'll obviously go to weightlessness, and then there's some automated systems in the spacecraft which will jettison the third stage and begin to deploy um, solar arrays and antenna. All of that should occur automatically. If it doesn't, then uh, the crew will go into action and command it manually. Coming up on the seven minute mark since launch, the crew reporting all going well. So use a rocket continuing to perform without a single hitch. That third stage continuing to fire, firing for an entire four minutes and two seconds. Au, dé au décollage, évidemment, la fusée était verticale. Maintenant, elle est presque horizontale et elle, elle accélère pour atteindre la vitesse requise pour rester en orbite. seconds of flight. Everything is nominal. We're feeling well. Everything is nominal on board. We're being about. Now over seven and a half minutes since launch, the vehicle now traveling at a velocity of almost 13,500 miles an hour. Once this third stage delivers the Soyuz into orbit and the module is separated, a series of pre-programmed commands will be executed in order to prepare the Soyuz for orbital operations. All parameters are normal. These stored commands are known as time-tagged commands and allow many of the Soyuz systems to be automatically activated by onboard computers at precise times already programmed in. 500 seconds of flight. Flight is nominal. Over eight minutes now since launch, no issues reported. So he's continuing to take these astronauts into their preliminary orbit. À ce moment, ils vont à peu près de 20 fois la vitesse du son. Vous avez vu sauter dans leur siège? C'est à l'arrêt des moteurs. And we have confirmation of third stage cutoff and separation. A single liquid-fueled rocket 
engine shutting down and dropping in away space. at an altitude of about 125 statute miles. Third stage performs a short avoidance maneuver by opening a valve in its liquid oxygen tank. And now getting confirmation that each of the antennas on board the Soyuz Bob. craft have been deployed. Solar arrays also being successfully deployed. Capsule and crew now safely in orbit. Bottom. Congratulations. Great. A happy day. Twenty. Twenty. This is Carlos One. We have you loud and clear. How us? Hello, we have you loud and clear. We are feeling well. Third stage separation contact occurred as scheduled and it's all nominal. Okay, we copy. Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, uh, it's uh, easy to say Godspeed, Chris Hatfield, after the launch is over. Um, the business is still risky, and I'm so pleased that the launch was successful. Chris now has several months of an amazing life, and I encourage you to <coughs> watch it on uh, TV. NASA Select will carry it, and I'm sure uh, most of the Canadian broadcasters will carry it. It will be an exciting uh, few months for Chris Hatfield and for Canada. Thank you very much.